UFP, the United Federation of Podcasts. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson, and welcome to edition four of TrekPod. My very special guest on this podcast today is the talented and gifted writer Dayton Ward. Since 1998, Dayton Ward has been silently shaping and reshaping our internal vision of the characters and events in the Star Trek universe. Star Trek fans around the world attest to Dayton's work and place him in the highest tiers of Star Trek contributors. So, without further ado, let's welcome Dayton Ward to TrekPod. Dark control reports ready, sir. Helm ready, sir. Orbital departure on plot, sir. Yard command signaling clear, sir. Maneuvering thrusters, Mr. Sulu. Maneuvering thrusters, sir. Old station. Thrusters at station keeping, sir. Welcome to TrekPod, Dayton Ward. Hi. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Thanks uh, for having me on. Well, uh, it's amazing. Uh, you are a very special guest, and um, I know a lot of people follow your work, and I certainly do, and I've read your books, and uh, I follow your blog, and I follow your humor on Facebook. Uh, it's quite wacky, and uh, it appeals to my sense of humor. A lot of people will know you, obviously, from your books. So what I'd like to do is maybe just start about talking about you in the beginning as a kind of an early life, how it all began. I mean, I, you, I believe you were born in Florida, but you now live in Missouri. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I was okay. born and raised in Tampa, Florida. And then oh. uh, fate and circumstance saw to it that I ended up here in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. And, and is that, did you go, you went into the army or you went into the Marines. Um, did you do that from the Florida end, or did you come to Missouri first or to Kansas City first and then no, do I, it? Yeah, I, I graduated high school in Tampa, and then I joined the service there uh, and then bounced around a few times and finally ended up in Kansas City as a final duty station before I left the service. Okay. And I just ended up staying here. My wife and I had decided that we liked it here, so we decided to stay. And that was 23 years ago. So Wow. Was that a, like something you, you, you always wanted to do or were you following a family tradition or what were you doing there? It's a little bit of both. My family has a, a service history, service tradition. Uh, my father's a retired Marine. Uh, my uncle was a retired Navy warrant officer. My father-in-law was retired Air Force. So it's, uh, it goes back a ways. My great-grandfather fought in World War II as a Navy, as a CB uh, oh, with the Navy. Wow. So he, uh, yeah, we have a long tradition. That's good. And well, it's good to have a family tradition flowing through there. Um, uh, and what you were, did you say, what age were you when you, when you moved out of Florida? I was 18 when I joined the service. Oh, so right. I went right out of high school. And then after that, you decided Kansas is the, is the place for me. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I got stationed here. Uh, my orders brought me here uh, while I was still in the Marine Corps. And uh, I was an information systems person. And so here in Kansas City at the time is where Marines pay and personnel information is stored and taken care of. Uh, so I was one of those people and decided when I was time to get out, not re-enlist and go into the private sector, this was a good place to transition into the private sector for information systems people. So that's where I ended up, uh, bounced around the different companies that are, in fact, there's a very large number of Marine information systems people who call Kansas City home now because <laughs> It's a very small community, and this is a pretty good place to hang out. Excellent. Um, I've only been there transiting through one time, and um, because I'm from overseas, uh, I never realized that the, the city is, is divided by the Missouri River. It's actually two different cities, um, one, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas. And they each have their own mayor, uh, but there is a joint government body that kind of helps deal with all the issues that affect both sides of the state line. And so they, there's, there's certain initiatives that, that uh, they call it a unified government. So for certain issues that affect the, you know, that area, they, they come together to work on these issues together. And so there's tax, tax deals and development and 
all matter of items that benefit the populations on both sides of the state line. Okay. And um, I also see that you still maintain a, a healthy interest in, in uh, military uh, interests. You, you, you work as a volunteer at the World War I Memorial? Yeah, the, uh, the National World War I Museum and Memorial, which was formerly called Liberty Memorial or Liberty Tower, uh, is here in Kansas City, in downtown Kansas City. It's been here since 1926. So I volunteer uh, three or four times a month uh, just as a guy, like a, not quite a guide. I'm not a docent or anything like that, but we are, we are expected to be knowledgeable about the war and the museum and, you know, the different exhibitions that we have and help guests get around and enjoy the experience. Yeah. I know nothing about what contribution the state of Missouri provided to the war effort, uh, in the first world war, but it must be considerable if they've erected an amazing monument to it. Well, I mean, I don't know that their their contribution to the war effort was any more than any other state. I mean, other than bodies, you know, they, you know, lots mm. of, a lot of, a number of men and women served from this area. Um, and at the time, shortly after the war ended, uh, there was a call or not quite a demand, but there was, there was a, there was a public request of sorts to honor the veterans of the Kansas city area who served in that war. So that's how it began was a, a war memorial for Kansas city area. Uh, military members and then it grew to encompass the entire war uh the memorial was was founded to honor all americans who served in the conflict and then uh, eventually it became a repository of history for the conflict itself so not just americans contributions to the war effort but all the other sides of the conflict if you go through the museum you know half the museum's main gallery is devoted to the period before the united states even entered the conflict uh in 1917 so it's it's a whole experience from the beginning to the end uh, and just over time, it became nationally recognized and form, then got that formal designation from Congress, you know, not that long ago, like 10 or 12 years ago. So it, it started off as a World War I memorial and now and then became the National World War I memorial. So it's kind of special and we, we are very proud of it. And I always recommend it to people who are passing through. <laughs> well, it's, it, uh, well, it's become even more recognizable now, that, you, know, you know, due to the p- people who follow your exploits uh, on Facebook and whatever. I spend a pretty good bit of amount of time there. I'm very proud of it. Good, good. Um, your experience in the military did that? Would you say that that set you uh, partially on the path you're on now? Do you think there's influences from your experience that shape what you do now? I think it informs my writing. Uh, uh, I certainly draw on those experiences from time to time, depending on what it is I'm writing. Uh, I like to think that the the discipline and the focus that you could develop as that life as, you know, it's, it's a, it's a vital part of surviving that kind of life uh, has helped me with my civilian career and then my writing career. Um, a lot of intangibles. I mean, I don't know that I can point to anyone thing from military service and go, that's what's made me successful. I think it's just a lot of intangible things you pick up and attitudes you, you develop and perspectives you develop that, that gets you through. Mm-hmm. I like, I like uh, in one of your stories, you've got, um, uh, a little bit of a skirmish going on between two aliens and they end up in the backwoods of Missouri somewhere and some Marine yeah. guy has to come that was figure actually, it all out. Uh, that was actually based on um, uh, the fact that while I was stationed here, we did not have a base. Uh, we, we have, so if we had to do our rifle, you know, drills or, go out to the, to the, to the woods and pretend we were infantry people for a couple of weeks and do all those testings and certifications. We had to go to another services facility. In this case, it was a national guard base called Camp Crowder down in Neosho. It's about four hour drive from here. So the starting point of that story with the Marine reservists who are not your frontline troops, they're not your, you know, they're, they're not special forces. They're not cream of the crop. Dealing with this issue is born of that scenario where we all go down there, a bunch of office workers and do our, do our bit of training every couple of you know, every couple of times a month or a couple of times a year. Excellent. Yeah. That's where I came from with that general idea. So uh, it just, while we were talking, it, it just threw a, a thought into my head and um, which is, uh, I don't know if you're aware that um, some years ago um, there's a U.S. Air, Air Force base uh, in the UK and some moons ago uh, they got a big scare when, when some people out on patrol absolutely swore to their captain that there was a ufo uh, landing (laughs) 
And uh, they got radio recordings. They had people out. They were scared to death. There was things happening. The evidence the next morning suggested something was there. It had gone. Right. And it, be, it remained a mystery for about 20 years, 25 years, maybe. Hmm. And uh, I, I've, yeah, I've seen, I've seen the, once or twice I've seen aircraft that I didn't recognize because we're near an Air Force base. Yeah. And you wonder if it's an experimental aircraft or some top secret design that they're testing or, you yeah. know, and then of course the X-Files comes along and you think it's re-engineered alien technology and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it but turned out that it was the uh, local um, RAF guys playing a trick. <laughs> Finally, somebody retired and f- figured it was time to own up and turned out that they had planted flash bombs and all sorts of things all over the place just to, just to get at them. Something to do. Right? Something to do. I wish they hadn't kind of told that story. I'd rather have it be the opposite thing. But anyway. Right. I'd rather keep it a secret for a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So um, obviously we, we know you as being a, a, a writer of really great Star Trek stories, but has, was Star Trek something that was in you before you even got into writing? And I, I mean, I'm trying to see, was there a curve that your writing took and you said, but Star Trek's going to be the, 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 the core of it. Oh, well, no, I, I didn't have a plan. If that's what you mean. No, this was not planned at all. Um, I was a fan. I mean, I, I grew up watching reruns of the original show. Uh, I'm old enough to have watched them in reruns in the 1970s. And I got to watch the cartoon on Saturday mornings when it first was broadcast. Um, so I got to play with the toys from the 1970s and build the models and read the comic books and whatever novels were occasionally published. So I was a fan big time. Um, loved it when the next generation premiered, loved watching the movies, you know, in the cinema, um, followed all the spinoffs as they came along. Um, the reason I started writing Star Trek was it was a fan thing. I was doing it for fun. Um, and then the first strange new worlds writing contest came from pocketbooks back in 1997. So I'm really dating myself at this point. Um, I was basically challenged or dared if you want to call it that by a friend to submit a story to that first contest. So I wrote a Star Trek short story and sent it in and they selected it as one of the 18 stories they picked for that first year's anthology. Um, I did it again the second and third year. And at that point I had rendered myself ineligible to enter further contests, but the editor at pocketbooks offered me a Star Trek novel contract. So I said, yes, because sure. What do you do when you've never written a novel or anything longer than a short story? You say yes. When they dangle money in front of you. Um, and that's how it started. I've been doing it ever since. So that's, we're going on 20 years now. I've been writing Star Trek novels. Did not plan it that way. <laughs> it just kind of happened. Well, it, you know, you, you have a talent. There's no doubt about it. You know, they wouldn't have come to you and said what they said if, if that wasn't the case. But it's an amazing story even in itself. I mean, we're all fans of Star Trek and we love, we, we can't get enough of it. We, you know, we'll take it from anywhere, any direction it comes in. Um, and the proviso is, you know, as long as it's good. Because right. there, you know, there, and, are, uh, there are some episodes that I don't need to watch again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like us all. But uh, in your writing, you, you, I was just kind of looking at um, the, the kind of timelines that you cover. So you certainly cover Next Generation and uh, and Deep Space Nine, and obviously Discovery because that was that's more or less the latest thing. I may be ignorant on this case, but have you done anything that includes the movie storylines? You like the newer the, movies or the yeah, or the well, older just movies? even anything from uh, the motion picture onwards. I think you wrote a book called Genesis Protocol, and I'm wondering if does the tie into the Genesis Project? No, that wasn't a Star Trek novel. That was just a science fiction novel that I wrote. Um, yeah. Wow, that's 13 or 14 years ago now. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was just a normal science fiction. Well, not normal, science fiction novel. Um, I have written a couple of novels that are set during the movie era of the original characters. So like after, I think I, I wrote one that was set after Star Trek V, and I wrote one that was set before Star Trek II. Um, but uh, most of my original start, for when it comes to Captain Kirk, the original crew um most of the stories i've written are set during the era of the show the original series yeah um and then i've written a lot of next generation books that are set after the the movies uh so several years after the last movie star trek nemesis uh just because the pocketbooks novels have been exploring that period of time after the films and after voyager for a number of years now we've been doing that we've been we were 